Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the KCN Sports Podcast. My name is Jordan Smith. On the other side of the table is Carlos Zimmerman, as we've got ourselves a jam-packed episode here today. We have got a lot to talk about. I say a lot. It's really a few main things, uh, and then we'll get to a special note in our final note segment uh, towards the end of the show. We've got MLB Draft Preview and taking a look at the All-Star break that starts tomorrow, followed by the... Uh, the debut of Colton Kowser getting to the show uh, and making his Major League debut. But first, we start with the NBA draft. Or the I say NBA draft. NBA free agency. Yes. It's all kind of meshed together, it, honestly. It, it really did. <laughs> but it's been a wild, and I mean like whirlwind of a free agency so far this year it, it it seems like every team has been able to get involved with playmakers one way or another and that's it's been great to see because you know especially for uh, us rocket fans we've had a lot of excitement coming out of the draft and then we've made some really good moves in the uh, off season as well we'll talk about in a little bit so it's it's been interesting to say the least yeah it really has and you mentioned the the rockets perspective on it as well uh and i kind of mentioned it what a couple episodes ago saying, you know, people that think the Rockets are a couple wins away or a couple players away from a playoff appearance, you know, hold your horses. You know, obviously they, they've gotten some good players uh, in the, the whole slew of everything. Let's just kind of go through the list. I've got this uh, information based off of value of the contract itself um, off of spotrack.com. My, one of my favorite websites I've been using for probably about five, six, seven years almost now. Uh, Jeremiah Grant with the most expensive contract in free agency, staying with the Portland Trail Blazers at a value of about $160 million, max value contract there, followed by Fred Van, Vl- Fred Van Vliet. I, okay, I'm going to be honest. I don't follow the NBA as much as I probably should, um, especially for working in sports and having a sports podcast. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> When, you know, I kind of looked at this, I said, yeah, I've heard of Fred Van Fleet, but who's Fred Van Fleet? <laughs> well, you know, and why are we paying him one hundred twenty eight and a half million dollars? OK, well, for three you, years, I, I, I follow the NBA, maybe just a tick higher than you, which yeah. is not saying much. Yeah, but I distinctly remember watching Fred Van Vliet in college when he played for Wichita State, a part of the team that really vaulted Wichita State shockingly, into the limelight of college basketball. He was that was part, horrible. I know it was. It was part of that big success that vaulted them to, uh, like I said, the limelight. And uh, ever since he's gotten into the NBA, he's played very well with Toronto. Do I think the value of the contract bringing him over to Houston was a bit steep? Possibly, because he's starting to get into his twilight years. Uh, but I think this is a really good grab and a guy that can run the point. For Houston, we were talking about, we've talked about how young the Rockets are. This is the kind of veteran you need leading your team at the point. Yeah, and you take a look at the uh, the average salary. This contract alone for the Houston Rockets is the highest average salary out of any team, including the player right behind him, Fred Van Fleet, at forty two point eight four six average per year. Right behind him, Kyrie Irving. Yep. 42 million average a year, 126 total. So just a couple million behind Van Fleet. Three year deal to stay uh, with the Dallas Mavericks and stay in the Southwest Division. <laughs> kind of taking a look at some, some other highlight uh, contracts throughout this free agency so far. Of course, all those unrestricted so far. Cameron Johnson staying with the Brooklyn Nets as a restricted free agent, $108 million deal. Kyle Kuzma staying with the, uh, the Washington Wizards. Chris Middleton staying with the Bucks. A lot of team, a lot of players in the top kind of staying with those teams. Not as much shuffle when it comes to the the higher value contracts. Um, the next one that I honestly I got kind of confused. I thought that this was a Rockets signed him and sent him to the Grizzlies in a in a sign and trade deal, but it was the Rockets getting him in a sign and trade deal from Memphis. Dylan Brooks, four year, eighty million, twenty million a year. Average salary on a max contract for him. Um, I'd say younger in today's NBA. He's he's getting close to a ten year career. If he was drafted, you know, at nineteen years old, 
He's 27 years old. Uh, you know, I don't, I feel like a lot of people are saying, I kind of agree. Again, I don't really follow basketball as much. So I'm just kind of going on what other, what other people say for the most part. Maybe an overvalue, I would think, of that Dylan Brooks deal. Possibly, but you know, this kind of comes full circle for Dylan Brooks because the Rockets were the team that originally drafted him back in 2017 mm-hmm. and then immediately trained him to Memphis. So it's come full circle. He's now coming to Houston. Yeah. Uh, but this is a guy that's coming off of a all defensive second team appearance in the NBA, which is really exciting. It's really his first big accolade since being drafted out of Oregon. So it, it's going to be a thing of yeah, you make a good point. He's starting to get up there in age for a small forward, but it can also play the two. So I think it's just a matter of just let's wait and see. Is he finally starting to hit his stride after having a good year in twenty three? I think it's a valuable aspect, excuse me, asset, but yeah, the price was a little steep. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like you said, you know, we talk about how old he is at 27, probably being closer to, you know, middle of career age nowadays with how young everybody is coming into the NBA draft doing the, the one and done deal in college now, coming in at 19, 20 years old. Is 27 still hitting the prime of your career? You know, regardless of, you know, Anything that's been in the past, usually getting around that age 30 is when you hit that prime in most every sport, including baseball. That kind of 27 to age 31 years, kind of that prime of your career. Um, So the fact that they're just getting him at what is supposed to be the start of his prime based on the law of averages, you know, maybe that could be something. We'll see. You know, of course, part of um, all these deals as well, the Rockets making moves, sending players away uh, in these... Uh, in these transactions, in these deals as well. Uh, kind of taking a look at uh, some of these deals. Trying to remember, K.J. Martin going to the Clippers uh, for Houston. Uh, I think that was somebody that we had kind of talked about maybe or maybe not. Um, maybe seeing him get shipped anyways. Uh, thinking that he could probably have a better role somewhere else. Uh, honestly, and just trying to retool this roster bit and it's you know the four position obviously with KJ Martin so bringing in Dylan Brooks Dylan Brooks I should say kind of helps with uh filling in that spot I guess and kind of getting a little order because he was Martin was drafted in the 2020 draft um out of IMG Academy so very very young um he played all 82 um last year 49 starts so you know he has probably above average experience, I'd say, for how young in, in the league he is, especially coming out of IMG Academy, basically getting drafted almost right out of high school, if yep. you will. Yep. Um, but I was, I was three when he was when he was born. A lot of these guys, 2001, 2002, 2003, and now Cam Whitmore born in 2004. This young crew that we're starting to see now, it's making me feel old. It makes me feel old, but it, it, it's impressive to see because you see just how much talent's getting pushed yeah. out of not only the, you know the big high schools, but uh, and like IMG, but also you know the universities as well. So I'm excited for the future of the Rockets with Udoka leading the way and you know a young core now with some veteran presence as well with bringing in Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks to help lead the young guys along to already complement what, you know, what DJ Augustine and Willie Cauley-Stein were already going to be trying to do for the Rockets. I still feel like DJ Augustine, he's either going to be that veteran guy that stays for a minimum contract the entire season and then retires, or he's going to get put in a trade piece. I feel, I really feel you like know, You is. know what I think DJ Augustine is? He is, to the Rockets, what Jeff Garcia was to the Texans. <laughs> he was just there. Maybe he was there, so he didn't get fined. Exactly. <laughs> so He came out of retirement to do that. I know he did. <laughs> and he actually played. Uh, did he play it down? Yeah. yeah. Well, because I know Jake he, DeLong remember did. Remember, TJ Yates got hurt. Right. And so Jeff Garcia had to come in, and there was no backup for him. That's right. Yeah, it was like the last game or two of the season. We're getting off track. NFL, <laughs> NFL talk's coming up later. But Taking a look at some of the other deals. Um, Karis LeVere staying with Cleveland, $32 million for two years. It's a good grab for them. Joe Ingles, uh, 35, almost 36 now, going from Milwaukee to Orlando, two-year, $22 million deal. Nice contract for a 36-year-old, pretty much. Dennis Schroeder, just about to turn 30. Schroeder. Schroeder, yeah. <laughs> Point I, B. I, I'm nitpicky about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. 
And I'm the one who took German in high school that, and in college. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's that's like me like uh, like mispronouncing like I'm trying to find a that I took Spanish all the way through high school and <sighs> and, and college and there's not a single history. You're doing great. That's like me pr- mispronouncing Lopez, Robin Lopes, or something like that. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Schroeder going from the Lakers to the Raptors, two year, twenty five and a half million dollar deal. Um, D'Angelo Russell staying with the Lakers, thirty seven million dollar deal. For a couple years, Brooke Lopez staying with the Bucks, forty-eight million dollar deal. Uh, Austin Reeves, fifty-six point two five million dollar deal for what a couple seasons mm-hmm. or four seasons, I should say. Reggie Jackson staying with the Nuggets, ten and a half or ten point two five million for a couple years. So, really, a lot of the big money grabs are really in that first probably ten fifteen players on the list. After that, you you kind of start to really kind of hunker down to probably hovering around 10 million or less a year, 10, 11 million or less. Uh, I mean, even another player, you got Seth Curry <laughs> going to the Mavericks from the Nets, two year, $9.2 million deal. Um, and even, I just saw his name, uh, Russell Westbrook, two year deal to stay with the Clippers heading into his, what will be his age 35 season, $7.8 million deal. Kevin Love, about to be 35, staying with the Heat. Two years, $7.6 million. Eric Gordon going to the Suns, which I thought was a good move for them, getting that veteran presence. Two years, $6.5 million. And Derek Rose, literally on the same exact dollar value, two years, $6.5 million deal from the Knicks to the Grizzlies, and then Jeff Green, one year, $6 million deal from the Nuggets to the Rockets to kind of highlight um, most of the free agent deals. Uh, in this this free agency, and you know, there's still you know some notable names that are still out there on the market right now. They're going to be looking to sign somewhere. Christian Wood is someone that comes to mind, um, according to this list. Um, Kelly Oubre out of Charlotte, uh, Ish Smith from Denver, Justice Winslow. Man, I loved him in college out of Portland right now. Uh, P.J. Washington, he's a rest- he's an he's an RFA out of Charlotte. Uh, here's an old name, Bismack Biombo, uh, <laughs> out of Phoenix. Or how about this, Udonis Haslam, hmm. out of Miami, one of the last big n- Nuggets from the golden days of Miami. So, Udonis, Udonis. I'm going to be picky about that. Udonis Haslam, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and then there's you know other big names, Blake Griffin, Andre Iguodala, yeah, and such. So. Uh, one of my favorites, Matthew Della Vadova. So lots Dang. of guys that, that could still go out there and get be, get picked up by somebody or be signed. So. Now let's kind of look at the other side of free agency because obviously free agency is getting players signed to contracts. But there's a whole other part of that spectrum that allows teams to get extra space and cap room and so on to go and sign some of these players or to build uh, capital to potentially get draft picks, which is what some of these moves are for some of these teams. And I feel like some of this is also the kind of maybe the same way for the Rockets as well if they do try to go after James Harden. Let's look at the trade market. What's happened with that so far? I already mentioned Kenya Martin going to the Clippers from the Rockets in exchange for two future first-round picks. Uh, the latest deal to happen was a three-team trade between the Dallas Mavericks, Boston Celtics, and San Antonio Spurs. The Mavericks get Grant Williams, and two second-round picks from San Antonio. The Boston Celtics get two second-round picks from Dallas. The Spurs get Reggie Bullock and a 2023 swap rights with uh, the Dallas Mavericks, the Spurs do. Um, And then some more uh, trades going on. Uh, The Jazz sending over Damian Jones to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, Indiana Pacers getting... Obi Topin from the Knicks for two future second-round picks. Uh, another three-team trade, once again involving the Spurs. You got the Cavs getting Max Struess, uh, the Heat getting a future second-round pick, the Spurs getting C.D. Oseman, Lamar Stevens, and a future second-round pick uh, as well in that deal. Uh, Victor Oladipo going to the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, from the Miami Heat in exchange for draft compensation and trade exception. Uh, Monte Morris goes to the Pistons for a second round pick and a trade exception from the Washington Wizards, or that's what they get at least. So you kind of see a lot of this is kind of exchanging draft picks 
Uh, not too many high profile names, I would say. It's just kind of more trading for depth uh, and building up the bench a bit and kind of getting draft capital. Um, there's even uh, one trade that it was entering the, the draft. The Chicago Bulls getting the number 35 overall pick in Julian Phillips. And the Wizards getting to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of see, like, there's some deals that kind of still have to be worked out, but at least the groundwork of it is there. A lot of it, obviously, is the draft night trades, trading picks, trading player rights, you know, so on and so forth. Um, teams moving up, teams moving down. Uh, one main one, an interesting one, Chris Paul going to Golden State in – the only asset that the Warriors got in that trade. In return, the Wizards got Jordan Poole, a 2030 first round pick, which is a protected top 20, and a 2027 second round pick. That's so far away, though. I don't understand why they say, yeah, let's get a. We're fine with a top 20 protected draft pick seven years from now. Yeah, and Chris Paul won't even be in the league anymore. He'll barely be in the league three years from now, probably. I know, and uh, Jordan Poole will be probably right near or just after the peak of his prime by 2030. So I thought that was rather interesting. You know, looking at the trades you had mentioned at the beginning, I think, you know, Dallas getting Grant Williams, as much as it pains me to say this, that's a good grab for them. Uh, gives you some veteran presence out there on the court, and you got him at a decent price. Um, I'm surprised the Celtics didn't try to get a little bit more out of Dallas, but they're going to get what they're going to get. I think the Clippers are getting a really good player in Kenyon Martin Jr., so... That, that one hurts a little bit because I know how talented he is and I would love to have him stay with the Rockets. But, you know, the Rockets try to clear up that roster space with uh, the people that they're bringing in. And I think an underrated grab, I'm, I, I've been high on Victor Oladipo since he got into the league after he came out of Indiana. And the Thunder get that veteran piece that they need because they're still going through their stage five, six rebuild. <laughs> so... <laughs> Lots of good moves there. One move you didn't mention, I'm surprised. Uh, Joe Harris uh, going to Detroit. Uh, Brooklyn only gets trade exception out of that trade. Yeah. Um, and Pistons get not only Harris, but they do get some later second-round picks, one via Dallas, one via Milwaukee in 27 and 29, respectively. So lots of, move ta lots of moves happened trade-wise. We'll see if the fruits come of it. And just to kind of wrap up the, the trade talk a little bit, uh, with some of the trades, the trade that sent Chris Paul to the Wizards in the first place. Wizards got Paul and Landry Shamet, multiple second round picks and multiple pick swaps. Suns getting Bradley Beal, player that we didn't know if he was ever going to leave for the Washington Wizards. Uh -huh. uh, as long as Jordan Goodwin and Isaiah Todd, that deal initially sending Chris Paul to the Wizards before he then got shipped out uh, to the West Coast. Uh, taking a look at uh, one other big trade that happened, another three-team deal, and I think it was really the catalyst of getting this thing started, at least the first domino effect of the Chris Paul-Bradley Beal deal, was the Celtics getting Kristaps Porzingis uh, in a three-team trade. They also got the 2023 first-round pick, which is the number 25 pick. Uh, they got the a first-round pick via Golden State, top four protected, uh, for the first round of 2024. So they'll have a top four pick next season as well to kind of build around Porzingis and whoever else they have there. Um, the Wizards getting Tyus Jones, Danilo Gallinari, and Mike Muscala, as well as a 2023 second round pick, number 35 uh, overall, which they ended up using, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then the Grizzlies just got Marcus Smith and that was it. So <laughs> kind of, I guess rebuilding that a little bit, but that's kind of the, the, the gist of the NBA trades, at least the majority of the, the big ones that, that we've seen so far. The final note on that, uh, whole Porzingis Gallinari smart trade is that I was intrigued about that first round pick that Boston got at number 25. That as actually was originally that I believe Memphis selected and, but, Memphis then traded that pick to Detroit via Boston. And who was that pick? Marcus Sasser <laughs> out of Houston. There you go. So that is a huge grab for Detroit. And that's just one tiny footnote in that entire, entire huge trade between those three teams. So coming up next, folks, as that wraps up our NBA talk, now we will transition to the Diamond. That's right. 
We got the MLB draft coming up. That's right there in the smack dab middle of the All Star break, and that's what's coming up as well. So stay tuned here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. Baseball talk is next. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Case Ham Sports Podcast. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. Alongside of me is Jordan Smith. Just talked about the NBA free agency and everything that came out of that. Now it's time to shift to our, probably our favorite sport, the Diamond <laughs> Sports. And it is baseball that we will talk about as Major League Baseball is just beyond the halfway point. We are knocking on the door of the MLB draft. The future of the Major Leagues getting ready to be revealed as well as the All-Star break festivities coming up here in just a few days. Talking about the draft, though, it's going to be very exciting. And there's been a lot of talk about, is there a consensus number one pick? And oddly enough, the two favorites are from the same school. (laughs) Uh, The current and reigning, defending, undisputed NCAA champion LSU Tigers... (sighs) I wasn't gonna yell into the mic and do that. I'm not. No, gonna, I'm I not was. Gonna... I was hoping you didn't say the actual company. No, because then we'd have to pay royalty. No, I, w- I wasn't <laughs> no, gonna I do that. I, I wasn't royalties, gonna do that. I, I wasn't gonna go full Paul Heyman there. <laughs> um, plus, we're in a small room. But yes, ladies and gentlemen. Nope, don't go there. <laughs> so it is down between uh, Paul Skeens, yeah, the incredible starting pitcher for the Tigers, and his teammate outfielder Dylan Cruz. Early on in the year, everyone thought, oh, it's Dylan Cruz, 1,000%. He's the num- he is going to be the number one pick. And then Skeens does what he does down the stretch of the season, really through the whole season, especially during the College World Series as well, to vault him to the number one spot. Are they, are, are they going to have Skeens go first over all that is the big question. Does Pittsburgh go that way? And I'm going to take the stance that Pittsburgh does go that way, given that they have already drafted position players over the last two drafts. Now's the time to go get their ace of the future. Yeah, and for me, the thing is, too, and we've talked about this with our group of friends before, um, the the thing you want to do in this situation if you're Pittsburgh, because like you said, you've got... You've got your prospects up in the majors right now with, I believe, still one or two maybe in the pipeline as your your main prospects before you have your, basically your full roster to compete with. Right now is a situation where, you know, with this building process for Pittsburgh, you go and get pitchers. Uh, and that's that's why I say Paul Skeens is, it should be the number one pick for the Pittsburgh Pirates in this draft because... As one of our friends said, it's very, very hard to come by a, a pitcher of that caliber uh, at the top uh, when it comes to the draft. You know, there, there's there been top-rated pitchers, obviously. Uh, the Astros have had a few that haven't panned out, but having a player <coughs> like... Know. Yeah, that was the one in my head. Uh, but, <laughs> but he finally made it to the majors. Uh, he, he got with the Phillies. Good for him. <laughs> but, um, but the main thing is that for Pittsburgh, if you're in a situation where you want to, you know, you're going to go get guys in free agency now to kind of fill that spot until you got your prospects come out. It's kind of like what the what the Astros did. You went and got guys like Verlander. You went and and got a couple other guys to to shore up your your rotation and your bullpen until your prospects, so Luis Garcia, Christian Javier, all those guys started to actually come up and take their spots. Then they kind of took over. Obviously, Verlander, he's now gone, for example. But point being, it's kind of the same thing if you're Pittsburgh now. You're in a situation where you need to start looking at pitchers. Not completely just get rid of position players altogether, but start looking at at pitchers and starters, bullpen, closers, setups. So that way you can really try to have that long-term success on the mound. Because having success on the mound will last longer than having success at the plate when you're trying to build a franchise. So getting pitchers like Paul Skeens, that'll help a lot when it comes to the long-term success. Now, how quickly is he going to make an impact? Obviously, we don't know. 
You know, there's been players who have had a very short ride uh, in the minor leagues. There's players who have had a very long ride in the minor leagues. And both bo- both sides have turned out fine in some cases. Um, but, you know, who knows? If they get him, I'm sure at some point he will make an impact at the MLB level and he will do some kind of good for the Pittsburgh Pirates should they actually take him at number one. Now, there's the other side of that coin, too. You go with Dylan Cruz, who is presumptively is... I mean, Wyatt Langford from Florida would try to give him a run for his money, but let's be honest, Dylan Cruz is the consensus best position player available in this yeah. draft. And let's say Pittsburgh does take Skeens number one. Then Cruz falls right into the lap of the Washington Nationals, a team that has had to go through. They're kind of going through the Kansas City Royals treatment right now mm-hmm. because they win a World Series, but they haven't done anything since. Right. So that would be a key piece for the Nationals, and, you know, if they, you know, raise him through the minor leagues right, he could find himself on a major league roster, I would say, no later than 2026. So yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued. It, it really depends on his development yeah. uh, in, in once he transitions now from the college level to the minor leagues. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly certain this is how it's going to go. Skeens goes number one to Pittsburgh. Cruz goes number two to Washington, and Langford will go to Detroit. You know, and I kind of, I mean, talking about Cruz a little bit, I don't want to put that pressure, you know, and start putting that label out right now because obviously he hasn't even been drafted to a major league baseball team. We don't know if he'll end up being a number two or if he may end up getting the switcheroo and going to Detroit. But Dylan Cruz is a guy, especially for that national to outfield, where you could replicate as much as possible of what you had in Juan Soto before you obviously had to ship him off because he didn't want to play for you anymore. Um, that That's a player in Dylan Cruz that could have a very, very good and a very, very long career uh, in baseball, like you said, as long as he's developed the right way. But he's a guy who could not put out the same production as Juan Soto because there's not a lot of people who can do that at all. Only a few. Basically, you'd have to go Shohei Otani, uh, who plays both sides of the field uh-huh. in order to <laughs> to find somebody who two ways <laughs> to find somebody who who produces better than Juan Soto. Or maybe a couple other players. That's about it. At least when Soto's actually being consistent. But Dylan Cruz is that guy that could really turn into your star of your franchise and could really lead kind of a a, a new. Um, a new era, a new age, I guess, of Washington Nationals baseball. But, you know, kind of looking at the three through five, I feel like those honestly are interchangeable, all outfielders. You know, all Detroit, Texas, Minnesota, they could all use uh, a little bit of outfield help. Probably not too much, but, again, this is something that's going to be a will it pan out or not in two, three years from now. So it's hard to kind of judge. But, you know, based off the need right now, yeah, any one of those, they could all switch around. The thing with Langford and why he's probably more of a stable pick out of those three is because of the fact that he's 21. You know, you've got, you know, Walker Jen- Jenkins and Max Clark coming out of high school at 18. Yeah, they're good, obviously. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the draft coming out of high school, just graduating and getting their high school diploma two months ago. But at the same time, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to, I guess, have a more stable look and kind of consensus on 18-year-olds than it is 20, 21-year-olds who have gone through the whole stable of college pretty much, 21, 22, 23-year-olds, whatever, and say, oh, yeah, we can, we've can." we seen through the upper-level competition what he can do. We've got no idea how they're going to do a rookie ball mm. as far as the 18-year-olds go. So that's why I feel Langford's a safer pick just because of age and experience-wise. Um, but, you know, it like I said, it's not a wrong or right pick, I would think, for that three through five if as long as they – Go and get any of those outfielders, honestly. So the mock draft that I was that I pulled up uh, was set by three guys: Jesse Rogers, Alden Gonzalez, and of course, Mr. Jeff Passan. Mm-hmm. So this was their uh, three through five. Uh, White Langford goes at number three to Detroit. Number four picked to Texas. They picked uh, Gonzalez. He picked Kyle Teal, hmm. a catcher from Virginia. And then Rodgers picked this, the ace from Wake Forest, Rhett Lauder, at number five to go to Minnesota, which, to be honest, 
wouldn't be a terrible move for me because when you look at the Minnesota Twins right now in terms of their starting rotation, obviously this is lucrative because he's not going to go to the majors right away, but eventually you look at it. Their current rotation right now is Sonny Gray, Pablo Lopez, Kenta Maeda, Bailey Ober, and Joe Ryan. What my point is trying to make there is it's an old rotation. I see nothing wrong. <laughs> No, no, that's if, just the toxic. Now, if this is 2017, <laughs> I'm excited. No, no, no. It, but, it makes sense. It, it makes sense. That pick, the Rangers pick as well, because you look at the depth chart for the Rangers right now, yeah, you only have you know two catchers, obviously, at the major league level, as most teams do, but Jonah Heim and Mitch Garber, they're not bad. They're, they're not great. Jonah Heim, obviously, the better player. That's why he's a starter, but... I don't see them being your guys in five years. And that's the thing. I think, like you said, getting that catcher uh, in Kyle Teal and letting him develop for a few years I think would be a smart pick uh, for the Rangers to try to just get a young guy, especially with some of the younger arms that are now starting to really populate the bullpen and starting to populate that that rotation uh, and getting a couple more prospects up from the minor leagues for the AL West division leaders at the moment. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think two would be a bad move for, for the Rangers. And then, like you said, getting that extra arms for, for the twins and, and louder wouldn't be bad either. So. And then kind of skimming my way down through here up to around the top 10. And, uh, the one that they picked at number eight is very intriguing to me. Cause I actually got to see him play this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy they have at number six passing, he went with Max Clark, which is an outfielder from, uh, Franklin community high school in Indiana. He would go. Uh, number six to Oakland, <clears throat> soon to be Las Vegas. Number seven would be Walker Jenkins out of uh, South Brunswick, North Carolina. He the best would, team in baseball at the moment. <laughs> he would go to Cincinnati, indeed. I'm, I'm on board. The one Ooh. that intrigued me at number eight was the one that Rodgers went with, is a shortstop that would go to Kansas City if it were to pan out that way. Jacob Wilson from the Grand Canyon Lopes. Hmm. I got to see him play, obviously, right. at the WAC tournament. Right. And, well, just just to toot the horn of the Bearcats, they shut him down. Right. He only went one for five in that 22-8 to eight monstrosity of a ball game. Which one? The, the, the one <laughs> Sam Houston played against Grand Canyon. Yeah, I, I, yeah, there was a lot of runs scored. Uh, there there, there were a lot of runs. That, I think that that was the catalyst that started the, uh, the, <laughs> the whole mess that Sam Houston went through either way. Yeah. He went one for five in that game against Sam Houston, but – an incredible shortstop uh, in his own right, and he can hit very well. The Bearcats just got the best of him that day. I'm intrigued to see if he g- gets his way into the top ten or if he falls out of it. And if and if he does fall out of it, if I'm around 11 and 12, the Angels, Diamondbacks, Cubs, I'm chomping at the bit to go after him because, man, can he play. I mean, why not? There's no reason you don't. I mean, plus... Out of those three teams, who's the one that probably needs the help the most right now? I'd say Chicago. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Chicago, then L.A., and then obviously the Diamondbacks are leading the West right now, so they don't need too much help, so they're not really going to go try to take that risk unless they want to just boost what they already have. But you look at the Cubs and the Angels, if neither one of them take them, then you got a guy who's starting to fall quite a bit. Yeah, you might see the Red Sox grab him, but other than that, he's going to start falling. Well, and he, here's the other thing too: if the Royals don't take him at eight, I mean, it could he could fall into the lap of the Rockies or the Marlins at nine and ten. <sighs> My thing is, are the Rockies going to want to lean that way? Because to me, they haven't had a solid shortstop since Trevor Story, and before that, to Lewitsky. So that would be a good grab for them in the grand scheme of things. The Marlins already kind of have a firmed up uh, middle part of the infield. So I don't think he goes there. So it's either Kansas City, Colorado, or he's falling out of the top ten. Yeah, and and the other thing is, too, with with the Rockies, I feel like with the way things are going with that franchise, like you said, not having – you know, a solidified guy since Trevor Story in the Tulowitzki era. Can I as well. can I give a visual of uh, what the Rockies have been like uh, since two thousand seven? Go for it. Twenty seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> that's about right. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if I'm the Rockies at this point, if I'm ever getting a shortstop, 
I'm just signing a guy. Mm-hmm. They obviously you've seen it has not worked, and if you're trying to play winning baseball in Colorado, you may as well just sign somebody. It's kind of the same way with starting pitching up there. No matter who you have, it's never going to work because of the elevation. Because a fly ball could turn into a 500 foot homer just because you blink, you know. And any wind that carries it makes it 525. All only because of the thin air of the elevation mm-hmm. up there in the Rockies. So it's, it's just, I don't know. It's a situation where, yeah, you. It would be interesting to see if you fell out of the top ten. I don't necessarily think it'll happen. But, yeah, if he doesn't get picked at number eight, I'd be kind of surprised that the Rockies got him, and I'd be very surprised if Miami got him. Otherwise, I would think, like you said, he would follow the top ten. So now that we've talked about, you know, that top ten look, I want to dive down to the Astros pick at 28. The mock draft that ESPN rolled out with, um, Gonzalez says the Astros are going to take an outfielder from Virginia, Jake Jaloff. Or Giloff. I don't remember how to pronounce it. But Jaloff, I think. I, I think, think it's Jaloff. But he was once a highly, and I mean highly touted prospect, especially going into this year and last year. And he came back to Virginia. And so now that he's found himself further down on the rankings, if the Astros were to pick him up at 28, I think that's an incredible grab because of the kind of play that he brings to the table. I mean, I'll pull up his stats real quick from this year at Virginia. Well, that was already – I was beating you to it. You were one <laughs> step ahead of me probably, yep. Taking a look at, you know, his numbers, uh, 81 hits on the season through 65 games played, a 321 average, 329 career average in three years at Virginia. Uh, and OPS over 1,000, sitting right about quick math here. It looks like about a one eleven thirty seven, so not not a bad OPS. Um, to make sure that's right here, like a seven ten on base or seven ten slugging, and a yeah four twenty seven on base percentage. So yeah, about eleven thirty seven uh, for his OPS. Uh, twenty three home runs, career high at Virginia for a single season. Ninety RBIs, forty eight walks. Um, so not a not a bad year. Looking at his numbers overall, 189 hits and 161 games played, so averaging over a hit a game, seven triples, 48 homers. It's so basically almost getting half of his homers in one season. So, yeah, a very good player who started to really develop in his own as he got more and more playing time and more and more responsibilities. Um, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad pick, especially for because I am still of the belief as much as I hate to say it, I am still of the belief, and no matter how many times that he has said he wants to stay in Houston, I still really think that Scott Boris led free agent, soon to be Alex Bregman, might not return as a Houston Astro. After this season? Whenever his contract is Okay. So I, I for whatever reason I just I have that it's not it's not a it's not a strong feeling, but it is a feeling that in my in my bad knee, my right knee, eh, kind of both of them are bad, but in my right knee, I got that bad slight feeling that he might not return to the Ashes because the amount of money he might demand because of Scott Boris being his agent may or may not work for what Jim Crane's wanted to spend. Now, I say that Jose Altuve's agent is Scott Boris. So... It's null and void in that situation, but I feel like, obviously, as we all know, Alex Bregman is more likely to leave than Jose Altuve. In Jose situation. Altuve is never leaving the Exactly Astros. the point I'm making. And so, I don't know. I, I would love to see Bregman back. Now that you've especially got Pena, you've got a very, very solid left side of the infield, middle part of the infield. Now you're just trying to figure out Who's your first base into the future? Because Abreu is not going to be coming back after the, the end of his contract. I can tell you that much right well, now. It's it's so. funny. it's funny you mention that because what uh, Gonzalez put on this mock draft is that he said, "quote I was scrambling a bit at the end here. Uh, first base is slim pickings at the top of this draft." He says he feels good about getting seventy grade power in Jalof. He would play first base. Yeah, and and that would be a good move as well. The Astros basically had his secondary at first base. 
That'd work too. It would, now, it granted, would help fix that situation. This is going to take a couple of years, obviously, for him to develop in the right. minors because, uh, as we'll talk about in our final note, you know, it took Colton Cowser two years to get up to the uh, to the to the major leagues. But and granted, that still felt fast. I know it, it did <laughs> feel really fast. Early on, we thought twenty twenty four. Nope. Fast track to 2023. So I didn't think it was going to be until a September call it this year. So, you know, you never know with the sport of baseball. So we'll see how all of that pans out. It's going to be an exciting draft. Draft night, I believe, starts on Sunday. Yes. Did I say that right? Yes. yes. Sunday rolls through Tuesday. They obviously got a million other rounds that they're not going to televise because the MLB draft is one of the biggest drafts, if not the biggest draft. 27? 20. 20. 20. They shortened it up to 20. That's right, because it was like 50-something before, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I don't know why they did that. Yeah. But so <laughs> that'll be intriguing to see how that all pans out Sunday. I'm sure you can watch it on the MLB Network. All right. All-Star break talk. One of my favorite times of the year because there's no stupid little cookie-cutter rules about the All-Star game anymore when in terms <laughs> of the World Series. Uh, but first, I want to lo- talk about the uh, Home Run Derby. And here is the field for said Home Run Derby. An interesting field this year. Luis Robert Jr. will face Adley Rutschman. Pete Alonzo, Big Meat Pete, will face the sophomore sensation Julio Rodriguez. Mookie Betts will go up against Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And Adolis Garcia will go up against Randy Arozarena. Where's Jordan? Where? Your, your guess is as good as mine. Did he not hit a walk-off home run against the Mariners in the DS? Did he not hit the game-winning home run in the World Series? Where's Jordan Alvarez, one of the best power hitters in baseball? <laughs> you should know at this point that Major League <laughs> yeah. Baseball hates the Astros. Yes, I, I realize that. I realize Have you that. looked at the roster that we'll talk about in a minute here of Astros that made the All-Star game? What was it? Nine, three, a couple of years ago, we had nine yeah. on the roster, and then we have three this year, and it was almost only two, if not Mike Trout, getting his annual injury of the year, <laughs> So, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So... Yeah, like I said, Robert against Rutschman. See, Rutschman was was interesting eh. as to why he was selected. Not really. He's only got 11 home runs this year. Right, but he's a catcher. I know. That's what you have to remember. That's a lot for a catcher. I, I know that's a lot and for a catcher. And tw- he's only 25 years old. That's like if Brad he was a rookie that's like last if, year. That's like if Brad Ausmus hit 11 home runs by the All-Star break. So Right, that's the thing. So he's having a great year. And again, you have to remember, he made his debut last year. Mm-hmm. He was a 2019 draft ra- draft pick, number one pick in the draft by the Orioles mm-hmm. to go along with the bevy of young guys they now have at the major league level in him, Gunnar Henderson. Now you got Colton Cowser. You got a few other guys as well to go with Batista, with Cedric Mullins, a very, very dangerous roster out there in the East. But point being, yeah, this is a great season power-wise for Rutgers so far. So I'm not as surprised that you see that. I'm just surprised at how much power he has for – how little experience he has. Just over, what, a year? Mm-hmm. What was that? 13 and a half months of Major League experience, and he's in the Home Run Derby. Some interesting notes about Rutschman. He is a switch hitter. No switch hitter has ever won the Home Run Derby outright. Uh, Ruben Sierra shared the Derby crown back in 1989 with Eric Davis. Aside from that, Lance Berkman is the only other switch hitter to make a finals. That was in 2004 at the uh, last time the uh, Minute Maid Park hosted an all-star game and home run. Derby. And probably the last time for a very long yeah, time. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, but Rutschman, being a catcher, no catcher's ever won the Derby before, but he now joins the likes of Salvador Perez, Gary Sanchez, somehow, uh, Joe <laughs> Maurer, and Pudge Rodriguez of guys that made the home run Derby. Why do you think side. Gary Sanchez made it? I can tell you why. Because he, he, well, he, he wore the pinstripes at that time. That's right. <laughs> Um, Pete Alonso going up against Julio Rodriguez. Alonso, That's going to be fun. Uh, 25 home runs. Rodriguez currently at 13 home runs. So we'll see how J-Rod will do in uh, this home run derby. I think I'll, I'll give that one to Alonso. Uh, between Robert and Rutschman, I'll go with Robert. I think it's just the safe pick, being the number one seed. I see the look in your eyes right now. You're thinking... I want to go with I want to I want to go with with Rutschman. No. <laughs> Let, let's look at Luis Roberts' numbers for a second here, because obviously there's a reason why he's the number one pick or the number one seed, I should say, uh, in all this. You take a look. He's like you said, 25 home runs uh, on the season so far. He's got a slugging percentage of 580, which is tremendous. 
He's got an OPS plus. Don't understand the stat, but I'm going to say it like I know it, of 147. So I, at least I know that is way above average because I believe average is about 100. Yes. So having that is already tremendous in itself. Um, I mean, yeah, he has had a very good season so far. It's going to be a tough fight, like you said. No catcher has ever won the Derby. So it's already an uphill battle uh, for Adley Rutschman. But, yeah, I think Robert may may take that. But I think Rutschman will still put on a good show. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'll go with Robert for that pick. Um, and then, like I said, for the 2-7, and seven, I, I want to lean towards the young gun. But I think Pete Alonzo just he, – he's already a two-time champion of the home run derby. So he's going to be gunning for three after winning in 19 and 21. So well, one thing to note is that home runs will come at a premium, not just because it's the home run derby, but because you're in Seattle. Yes. We have a prime example of that. When the Astros go up there, any with a team that's built basically on, on a good amount of power hitters in the lineup when they're all there and they're swinging, you average about three, four home runs a game, probably about 10 a series when you go up to Seattle so having a home run derby there, that thin air, yeah, that coastal wood, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be nice. It's gonna be a very <laughs> nice home run derby. So if you got a glove, bring it. Well, here's the thing: are they gonna have the roof open or not? It doesn't matter either way because the way that ballpark is built, even if it's closed, there's no windows. Mm. There's no windows on the outside wall that's adjacent to what was Century Link Field. There's no wall that sits behind the right side of the ballpark, right behind the stands. It's just open air. So even if the roof is closed, you still got wind coming in through those little slots and kind of creating a vortex, if you will, in a weird, very weird configuration. So I would think they would have the roof open, honestly. Um, Because, I mean, even in Houston, when they had it back in, what was that, you said 2004, roof was open. So I, I would think the roof would be open. Uh, in that situation, but yeah, I I don't know. I I just I, there's gonna be a lot of home runs, and I think there's gonna be some home runs that may shock a few people. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some hit hit the uh, the the light fixture mm-hmm. out there in left center. Uh, breaking down the three six, Mookie Betts from the Dodgers, twenty three home runs right now. Vlad Jr. only thirteen home runs in Toronto. Right now, this is his second derby for Vlad. Uh, he made his first one as a rookie in 2019. Uh, Mookie's making his home run derby debut. And I'm going to be honest, not just because it's the fun pick. I'm going Vlad here. I, I was thinking Vlad as yeah. well. And, and I not no disrespect to Mookie. Very great player. Obviously, deserves to be in the home run derby this year. But I don't know. I feel like I'm not going to say experience wins here because it's barely experience for Vlad Guerrero. You know, you have one derby, but I don't know. I feel like he's kind of more in tune with himself as a power hitter nowadays than he was back then when he was making his debut in the derby. So I think he would probably have a little bit better edge. Granted, Mookie Betts has been in the game a lot longer, but it's also taken him this long to get to a derby. So If, if Vlad Jr. is to win it this year, him and his Hall of Fame dad would become the first father-son duo to be home run derby champions. Because remember, Vlad Sr. won the 2007 derby near the end of his career when he was with the Angels, defeating Alex Rios in the finals. So that would be an interesting thing as well. And Guerrero's really ripping the ball well this year. He leads the AL in hard hit balls with 152 hit 95 miles an hour or harder. (laughs) Well ahead of anybody else in the derby. And then the 4-5 matchup, the one that you think, oh, this could go either way, whether this is a March Madness bracket, a NBA playoffs bracket, or a home run derby bracket. And it's two of guys that you didn't think you would ever see. It is Adolis Garcia from Texas, Randy Orozarena from Tampa Bay. Garcia at 21 home runs right now on the year. Orozarena is at 16. Uh, Garcia was the last home run derby participant to be released. And it's been a long time since a Texas Ranger has won a home run derby. 30 years to be exact. Mm-hmm. When Juan Gon, Juan, Gon, Juan Gonzalez won the <laughs> crown in 1993. That's a good nickname. Yes, indeed. And then uh, as for a Rosarena, he's just the third Rays player to qualify for a home run derby. The first since Astros legend Carlos Pena in 2009. So Not bad. And Evan Longoria was the first in 2008, coming off his rookies, one of his uh, early seasons. So. 
that's a toss up there. I'm going to lean towards Garcia because he's just been hot as of late, especially on the field. And then I think in an isolated uh, environment, if you will, he could top a Rosarena. I got a Rosarena. No reason other than just to go opposite of you okay. on this pick. <laughs> now, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's a toss up either way with this one, with the four or five. It always is. Um, I think a Rosa, I don't think it's going to be a, you know, somebody wins it by like 10 home runs. I think it's going to be you, you, you swing the one that gets you the win in that first round. Uh, probably if you're, uh, a Rosa Reina, cause yeah, I would assume he would be the one that goes second. I'm not exactly sure how so. they're going to do that, but I don't know. either way, um, I think a Rosa Reina sneaks it out now to pick the final. I'm gonna be honest. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I think I kind of throw a curveball here. I got Alonzo versus Guerrero. That that's, that's that's my final. That's where I was leaning. Yeah. Uh, I I think that would be a stellar home run derby final. You know, two young guys that are trying to just you know make their mark in major league history, and you know, obviously, there's nothing that really comes out of the home run derby other than uh, patting yourself on the back. Uh, but, yeah, I think that would be a fun final for all the fans in Seattle and then, of course, for you know all the fans watching on TV. It, it would make for very good TV uh, to have you know the son of one of the more greater baseball players in recent history and then Pete Alonso, who's just tearing it up in his own right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to agree with you. Pete, Pete Alonso and Vladimir Guerrero, Guerrero Jr. Dark horse for me, um, probably would have to be... Julio Rodriguez, if he is able to get past Pete Alonso. My dark horse is a Rosarena. Mm -hmm. I, I think he could, because if I'm not mistaken, it's not it's not an 8-4-2. It's just an 8-2, right? For what? The home run derby. They just go from eight players to two, right? Or is it 8-4-2? No, 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 it's like a, a bracket. It, it's a bracket. Eight, yeah, four, then I, I think a Rosarena could, could sneak in there and make a little noise in that first round. Like I said, win that first round. And kind of push the limit there on a, on a second round matchup. Mm -hmm. um, that I don't know if you'll get past there. Like I said, I feel like it's going to be between Vlad and and Alonzo in the final. Um, but uh, that's just kind of my thinking. That watch, watch a Rosarena in this derby. He may he may surprise a couple of people. So so it'll be interesting to see home run derby coming up. Uh... This is going to make me sound bad. On Monday, <laughs> Monday night, 8 Eastern on ESPN. Then, of course, the All-Star Game is coming up very soon. Tuesday, July the 11th on FOX Fox. Looking at, briefly, just checking a look at the rosters here. The Looking at the American League side, the elected starters. A lot of Rangers in that lineup. Mm -hmm. Jonah Heim behind the plate. Marcus Simeon playing over at second. Josh Jung at third. Corey Seager, the big offseason acquisition for Texas at short. Over at first from Tampa Bay, Yandy Diaz over at uh, was originally going to be in the outfield. Mike Trout, but now with his um, humate, I think that's how you say it. That's what he injured. It, it's something on his hand. That got injured, so he's not playing. Randy Orozarena is the only outfielder that was elected to be a starter that is going to be playing in that game because Aaron Judge, on the other side, he has elected not to play in the game. So don't understand that. I don't understand that either. And then, of course, the designated hitter for the AL The is... greatest player in baseball today. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Shohei Otani. Hey! And then, looking at your reserves... Please tell me he's going to start. He he will. <laughs> As a pitcher. And he <laughs> Well, Please, he's, he's let it there. happen. He's there as a pitcher, too. <laughs> so we'll see. Looking at the reserves, two catchers, Salvi Perez, RIP, because he's in Kansas City. Um, Adley Rutschman, of course, going to be elected to elected to his first All-Star game. Vlad Jr., Whit Merrifield, because he still plays baseball. Bo Bichette, Jose Ramirez, Wander Franco. That's your infield. Wander Franco, a late ad from Tampa Bay. And then the outfield, Luis Robert, Austin Hayes. Jordan Alvarez was selected, but is not going to play. Adolis Garcia, Kyle Tucker was added because Trout got hurt, uh, Julio Rodriguez, and then the back of DH is Brent Rooker from Oakland because you have to have a team, a member from Oakland for what whatever godforsaken reason. Gotta have at least one from each team. Gotta have one from at least from each team. Pitchers, Shohei Otani, Garrett Cole, Luis Castillo, Sonny Gray, Nathan Nivaldi, another one from Texas, Kevin Gossman, 
Shane McClanahan was elected but will not play. Framber Valdez is there. Michael Lorenzen and George Kirby was added due to McClanahan's injury. And then your four relievers, Ken Lee Jansen from Boston. That's weird to say. Emmanuel Classe from Cleveland. Felix Bautista and Yenier Kane, Kane, Kano. Cano. Cano, sorry. <laughs> like from, Robinson. I, I know, from Baltimore. <laughs> National League side. Their starters. Catcher Sean Murphy out of Atlanta. Freddie Freebombs, first baseman from the Dodgers. Luis Arise from Miami. My you wanted to say the Braves, didn't you? I almost Freeman. did. I almost did. <laughs> Oh, man, good old days. But Luis Arise, my pick to win, what what is it, the NL batting title. Uh, Nolan Arenado from St. Louis at third. Orlando Arcia from Atlanta at short. Ronald Acuna Jr. from Atlanta in the outfield along with Mookie Betts. And Corbin Carroll from Arizona. The DH, uh, former Astro, J.D. Martinez. I think a lot of people forget. He that was he was an Astro before he went off as a Boston Red Sox. And now with the Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, their reserves, two catchers, Will Smith and Elias Diaz from Colorado. Smith from the Dodgers. Their infield, Matt Olson, Ozzie Albies, and Austin Riley, all from Atlanta. Dansby Swanson, former Brave, now with the Chicago Cubs. And then, of course, Big Meat Pete and Pete Alonzo. Uh, their outfielders, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., making the jump over to Arizona. Uh, Nick Castellanos in <coughs> Philadelphia, the breaker of hearts and everywhere when it comes the to The saver of a PR nightmare. Uh-huh. Uh, outfielder Juan Soto from San Diego, and the des- backup designated hitter is Jorge Soler from Miami. Pitchers, Zach Gallen from Arizona, Spencer Strider, and Bryce Elder from Atlanta. I believe Elder's making his first appearance in the All-Star game. Justin Steele, same thing for him from the Cubs. Mitch Keller from Pittsburgh, Josiah Gray from Washington, Clayton Kershaw was elected but will not play, Marcus Stroman from Chicago as well, and then the relievers, Alexis Diaz from Cincinnati, Josh Hader from the Padres, would love to see him in an Astros uniform, Devin Williams from Milwaukee, Camilo Duvall from San Francisco, and then David Bednar was added due to Kershaw's injury from Pittsburgh. Did you see what Bednar did uh, to Clayton Kershaw? I did not know. So, okay. So, obviously, Bednar gets selected. Uh, the video goes online of the Pittsburgh Pirates of them telling Bednar in the locker room that he's getting selected to the All-Star break. The only way you do it with David Bednar, you give him a 12-pack of a cold brew. <laughs> because it's David Bednar. Right. He then took a few of those from the 12-pack, put it in a cooler, gave it to Kershaw, left it in the dugout, and said, "Here you go, bud." And said, "Thanks for <laughs> basically thanks, you know, for letting me get to the All Star game." So that's uh, he didn't say those exact words, but basically handed him a, cold, a few cold ones, saying thanks. So that's how Bednar celebrated, that's... and then he probably drank the rest that same night. Uh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm certain he did. Uh, I love Bednar. So, so that's a look at your All Star rosters. Obviously, for us Astros fans, we're only going to see maybe. One, make an appearance if Fromberg gets in. I don't know if Tucker's going to get a chance to get in. I know they try to get them all in at one point or another, but, you know, it, it, it's tough to see how far we've fallen off in getting some Astros onto the All-Star rosters. But, hey, we're going to give Texas their credit right now because... They're playing good baseball. They're playing good baseball, but... It's short coming. We're only two games behind. Well, because as of this moment. the Astros decided to win in the series. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we tried to lose to Colorado, but yeah, we're talk about that. we picked up two crucial wins there. And now we're in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, and we're just going to stay there. Yeah. Hope. Well, at least Jordan, Tucker, and uh, Fromber will stay in Seattle. The rest of the team can come back to Houston. Yeah. yeah. So, wait, well, no, the series is at home. Is it? Yeah. Hmm. I'm tired. Same. So. Very. That'll wrap up our MLB talk. What time are we sitting at right now? Well, let's see here. Let's pull this up. Oh, we're good. We're just over the hour mark. Just over the hour mark. Do we want to talk NFL? Is it too early? I don't know. I mean... We're in July. It is. It's not a ton happening. It's mainly just, you know, kind of the the rookie mini camps or whatever they're called. Um so seeing how, you know, these, like, young guys are going to pan out. Yeah, before they do the, the, the mandatory, mandatory, I should say, 
uh, training camp for everybody, uh, which I think is just right around the corner, probably towards yeah. the end of the month, maybe. And, and the odd thing, know. and the odd thing is that there hasn't been a whole lot of talk about you know guys holding out of training camp, which is a good sign. Thankfully, <laughs> that would have been Lamar sign. Jackson. It for would sure. have been Lamar Jackson for sure, yeah. but they struck the deal that they needed to. Yeah, so. so, and nothing really out of you know Saquon Barkley's group. No. So it really, everything's just kind of uh, fine and dandy, and that's kind of scary. Calm before the storm. If yeah. You know. I think so. there's a lot more that's going to be coming about, especially in, into this new season. Yeah. Just looking briefly looking at the outlook of this this upcoming year, I, I don't think really outside of maybe Kansas City, is there a clear-cut favorite to win it all this coming year? I think there's... The, I don't I don't really think so. No. And, and that's the thing. It's just that's that's Kansas City. I mean, I guess just kind of taking a look at the, the NFL standings from, from last season... I mean, the only one I could see is the Bills contending in the AFC. Um, Bengals, yeah, they'll be there, but I mean, it's really the Chiefs or the Bills winning the AFC, you know. And then you kind of look at the other side. Obviously, you had the Eagles fourteen wins, you had the Forty ers thirteen wins, you had the Vikings thirteen wins somehow. But I don't know, like the way the NFC works, it, there's not a clear cut favorite every year. I think if there is one clear cut favorite though in the NFC. It's Philly. I think the only way that things change is depending on the 49ers quarterback situation. What mm-hmm. happens with that? What happens when Purdy is off the injury? Will he get put back into the starting role? Or will they go with you know whoever's going to be starting there at this point? Because it ain't Jimmy G. Nope. Cause he's it ain't Tom good. Brady out of retirement because he's now a part owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh-huh. So in other words, he gets to watch over Jimmy, Jimmy G as he's the quarterback for probably the next two years. Um, <laughs> so or, it's basically Brock Purdy, or you hope the guy that's filling in until he gets back does well enough. It's the, it's the North Dakota State guy. Is it Lance? Yeah, it's Trey Lance. Huh. I guess they haven't gotten rid of him yet. No. <laughs> so it's down to... Oh, Lord. You know... I can't say his nickname that people rolled out yeah. with, um, but with Brock Purdy or the former buys and Trey Lance in San Francisco. Yeah. So we'll see there. I, I'm intrigued how, you know, as a Texans fan, how the AFC South is going to pan out because you look at who's now the field general for all four of those teams. You look at the Texans, of course, you're likely going to be going see CJ Stroud. Maybe a veteran takes the start week one. I, I I don't know. It would be Davis Mills. It would be Davis Mills. So because looking at the depth chart, your only other option is Case Keenum, and he's the third string QB at the moment. They're not expecting him to play. He was purposely no, he, signed to mentor. Exactly. He's purposely signed for that, and he was perfectly fine with that. I'm excited for this Texans roster. Before we get back to the field generals, to see Damian Pierce mm-hmm. in this West Coast offense. Oh my God. We saw what, and we see all the time, what running backs can do in a West Coast. We saw it with Arian Foster. It's not the same exact West Coast, but it's something you know, kind of similar with a little bit of 49er mix into it. Uh, but Damian Pierce in this offense, ooh, it's going to be fun to watch. Absolutely. And you look at the other you know, pieces that they brought in, like we, we've talked about just off the air before. There isn't really any, you know, sexy named wide receivers that we have out there. I mean, Amari Rogers is good. John Mechie's good. Robert Woods for the uh, veteran presence. That's your number one. I mean, and then you have Nico Collins as well as an option. But I really think that this offense, this West Coast offense that they're going to be rolling out with now is going to rely heavily on the running backs. And I'm excited for, and people, and Dallas fans were like, ah, you can have them. You can have them all you want. Yep. I think we got to steal in Dalton Schultz. Oh, absolutely, because here's the thing. We're in an offense that uses a tight end. Yeah. We're going to have for the first time in what, six, seven years? Since Fedorowicz. A tight end who has more than four catches a season? Mm -hmm. It's going to be amazing. Not to mention, because of this offense, we basically have a fullback again. Mm -hmm. A position that's basically died out. We've kind of revived it. Yeah. Thankfully. And then and now you also have an O-line to protect whichever quarterback. It's not a bad one either. That you have there. I mean, you got... It's not you, great, but it's not terrible. I mean, you have some guys from the old days, Titus Howard, uh, Laramie Tunsil, of course, the anchor of that, mm-hmm. of that Texans O-line. But then you got Shaq Mason. You've got, you know, rookies like Juice Scruggs and Jared Patterson. You have... 
Um, Scott Quessenberry and Kenyon Green, Kenyon Green, the left to left guard, Charlie Heck, who has had experience starting oh. at tackle. So that's exciting to see. Same thing on the D line for the Texans. I think you're going to, I mean, that, that of course is going to get whittled down, but obviously getting the big, big grab of Will Anderson was huge. Bringing him in. My favorite part of the draft. Mm-hmm. Really, I, I think this is probably one of the more put-together Texans teams that we have seen in a while. It, it, in probably 10 years. Probably. I, is it going to turn into a playoff team? I don't think Not so. this year. Not this year. You but still need a lot you, of pieces. You get, you get one year of this team and you keep this core together? Oh, my goodness, 2024 into 2025? They're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Now, people have to remember, this is going to be a little bit different kind of a Bulls on parade defense from what we've seen in years past. Back in the Gary Kubiak, Wade Phillips era, it was a 3-4 defense. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a base 4-3 defense. You've got the 2-D tackles, the 2-D ends, and then you've got the Will, Mike, and Sam linebackers sitting there in the middle part of that, that secondary line of defense before you even get to the secondary and get to the safeties and the corners and all that. So it's going to be a little bit different kind of feel. You're not going to have basically five guys on a line rushing all the, the linemen with two kind of quarterback spies in the middle. You're now basically going to have that four with maybe one QB spy, probably out of the will in Christian Harris or in the Mike and Christian Kirksey. But really, it's going to it's going to be interesting, I think, to see how this defense rolls around, especially with what I assume – is going to be a heavy influence from D'Amico Ryans, one of the better uh, defensive players during his time, especially in Texans history, and one of the best defensive coordinators in the league before getting the job as a head coach now with the Houston Texans. It's going to be interesting to see, especially early on in the season, first game of the season, Baltimore. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they put pressure early on, how they rush, how they blitz, how they also protect that middle part of the field because you blitz too much, that middle part of that, that linebacker spot is wide, wide open, open, and you're going to have check down six, seven-yard passes the entire game. And so it's going to be interesting to see how they mix that up. And Baltimore knows a lot of things about check downs, <laughs> right. given their history with Joe Flacco. Yeah. So <laughs> that'll be intriguing to see. What I'm excited about most is that secondary. Mm -hmm. It is probably the most high-profile secondary that the Texans have had since Jonathan Joseph and Kareem Jackson were at the helm. And Daniel that, Manning. And Daniel Manning of that secondary. Desmond King on one side. In the safeties, you have Jimmy Ward at the free safety. And then you have Jalen Petrie at the strong safety. And then you have Derek Stingley on the other side. Holy cow. It's, it's good. I don't think it's all the way there yet. I still think they need another corner. Maybe another safety. But it is a very solid piece. At least a corner. I think they need before I can really say this is a solid, solid unit. Because you have to remember, there's going to be situations where they're going to go, they're going to go three corner sets, and well, they're still going to have the two safeties. So that means you have to take out a, a linebacker. Then, you then, know? then I would say you could probably go with Shaquille Griffin. I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad option, but I don't know. I just, I, I feel like they still need that one more, not to necessarily replace the starters or not. But to have as a depth piece for when you have to go three corners or when you have to basically either go cover three, for example, or whatever, you still need – I still think they need that one more corner before I can really say this is a truly solidified ball hawk secondary. But it is still a good defensive secondary. And like you said, I'm excited to see uh, what they do. But you know, kind of going back to your field general point, you know, like you said, Trevor Lawrence, the 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 lead dog, if you will, the, the AFC South right. chance, which is still weird to say. Yeah. Uh, then you've got obviously the Texans, like you said, CJ Stroud. Um, you got the Titans and whatever they're trying to do. <laughs> but Levis. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know if enough Mayo is going to save his coffee or not. But and you got the Colts with uh, Anthony Richardson. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see how that goes. I think it's going to be fun for about uh, one season, and then I, I, I want him to succeed. I don't want him to succeed against us, but I don't know. It's, I mean, it's really going to depend on how he develops against this defense and how quick he can adjust to reading defenses 
uh, on the fly and before the plays even happen and stuff because, as everybody knows, he's the project guy. Mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson is that project guy. He had a very good combine that shot him up the draft board. Um, even at one point in in his uh, pro day, throwing a ball so high and so hard to hit the roof mm-hmm. of the practice facility in Florida. That's what really got teams to start kind of turning around on him a bit They're like, and boosting up his, his draft stock. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Your, your lead dogs in this division are Trevor Lawrence and probably C.J. Stroud if he can develop in this rookie season. But like you said, I would think, and at least the smart thing for me would be, to throw out Davis Mills for a game, maybe two, kind of let C.J. Stroud, uh, especially if it gets into a garbage time situation where you're down by a lot in those early games, let him go in the fourth quarter. Kind of let him kind of get a little rep, still have him get rest of the first team, but let the veteran get a couple starts, then throw in C.J. so you're not feeding him against Lamar Jackson week one of the season. Well, you have to think that when you in, in our last touch here on the NFL before we go to our final note in the next set, in our final segment, the probable starting quarterbacks in my mind, the only one that's going to be constant is that Trevor Lawrence is going to be starting for Jacksonville week yeah. one. For the Texans, I think they're going to roll out Davis Mills for week one. It would be smart to. It would, yes, it would be. It would. They, they would. It would behoove them to do so. For Tennessee, remember you still got Ryan Tannehill. So yeah, that's not saying much anymore. I know, but so you either go Ryan Tannehill or you go Malik Willis week mm-hmm. one, and I'm thinking they're going to go Tannehill yeah. with, without a doubt in my mind. For the Colts, it's interesting. I mean, you're kind of in a spot where you have to start Anthony Richardson. Mm. You have Gardner Minshew, who has NFL starter experience. Or do you go Sam Ellinger? No. <laughs> as much as, you know, as I've said before, and we know on this show, I'm a UT kid at heart because that's what I grew up with. That's what my grandfather went. was in the marching band whole nine yards, right? I like Ellinger. He was a decent quarterback at UT. I don't honestly know if he's an NFL quarterback. I'm going to be honest. I I don't know. Yes, he had very good flashes um, uh, when he did make appearances, uh, what, last season. But I don't don't know. I'm going to be honest. I think really your only only spot is going Anthony Richardson with one and having Gardner Mishu as a two – to kind of help Richardson develop a bit as that starter, and then Ellinger there is in, in case of injury. Yeah, that that's really how I kind of see that playing out. Like you said, the depth chart kind of sitting right now. I don't really think it's going to change from that, but I don't know. I, I that's kind of my thing. I don't think Anthony Richardson isn't the starter. I think he is starter week one. He so he would be the only rookie out of that bunch to start week one I would think so uh, granted I feel like the Texans will probably still start CJ Stroud since he is number one on the depth chart right now uh obviously being the number two pick in the draft but if the Texans were smart about it at least give him a couple games to sit on the bench and then wait kind of develop learn the playbook a little bit throw on the headset and kind of hear you know audibles or kind of how things are kind of done so he can watch it and see it before he then starts to go on. Because I said this before the draft. If you were going to get a quarterback between Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud, as much as I did not want the Texans to take a quarterback at all this season, I said if you are going to take one, you have to get C.J. Stroud. Because for me, he has the higher upside when it comes to the draft. Now, I'm not saying Bryce Young isn't going to be a star in the league. He could very well be. I just don't know that it's going to translate with the Panthers. And that, that's my main thing. And, I that's don't know. The, and that's the unfortunate for, thing for him as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it comes out. And as the weeks progress, ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk more about the NFL and what's going to be coming up for them. Eventually, we'll get to our season full season preview. We just wanted to give you just a tiny little tease <laughs> today on our outlook for what is to come this NFL season. We'll step aside and take a break. Coming up next, our final segment, the final note. Colton Kowser, our Bearcat. He's in the show, and he made his debut last night for the Baltimore Orioles in a big win over those stinking Yankees. So that's coming up next in our final note on the KSAM Sports Podcast.
Hello. Accidentally clicked that too early, but either way, we're back. On the, stop laughing at me. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Are you laughing at me? I don't know. Okay. Either way, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jordan. That thing over there is Carlos. <laughs> um, so, like you said, final note segment. We get into the big news that came out of left field yesterday, quite literally. Colton, <laughs> you're welcome for that one. Uh, Colton Kowser getting selected to the show, making his MLB debut last night against the Bronx Bombers, the Pinstripes, the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium. Yes, I agree with that fullheartedly. As a member of the Baltimore Orioles, the number 14 ranked prospect in the MLB pipeline, I believe the one or two prospect at the time for the Orioles before the number two. Uh, thank you, Carlos, before getting uh, called up. Went one for three last night. His first hit, an RBI single, and I believe the sixth inning of play. Uh, in the second, he had an at-bat. He, I believe, struck out. I could be wrong on that. But he didn't get a hit in, the, in his first at-bat. But he got it in the sixth. RBI single. He also came around and scored a run as well uh, in the, I believe, six to four victory for the Orioles last night. Six, six to three six victory three. against the Yankees. And what was a very, very cool debut uh, for... Colton Kowser, number five pick out of the 2021 LLB draft by the Orioles. Um, was kind of a surprise he went five uh, initially, I think, from everybody. I think they were kind of expecting to go a little bit later in that first round. But the fact that Baltimore went and got him that quickly, I think, was a good sign, obviously, for the Orioles because they've got, they got what was. And I said this, and you can back me up, Carlos, on this. I said this to pretty much everybody I knew, especially all of us that were – uh, at Sam Houston at the time, working for the school newspaper, the Houstonian, and covering sports and talking with all the people I knew in athletics. Because I've known Colton Kowser and that family for a very, very long time. Basically my entire childhood. I grew mm-hmm. up with his older brother. He was one of my friends, church friends. We grew up in the same class together, graduated together. His dad was my uh, associate pr- or assistant principal uh, when I was in high school. Uh, I played baseball with his older brother, uh, not not Colton, but his older brother, Ty. So I, I've known that family for a long time. We're good family friends. Not as much now because, you know, high school, you drift away from everybody until you get to the 10-year reunion, which is next year for me. But point being, <laughs> <laughs> don't give me that look. I know I'm old. I know I'm old. Mine's <laughs> in three years, so I'm going to let it slide. <laughs> Continue. But – I told everybody because I had covered some some of his high school. It was more so his last season in high school before he made the jump to college and eventually got to Sam Houston. I said, "Watch this kid. He's going to become the best hitter this program has ever seen." And you take a look at his numbers in his three years at Sam Houston: three fifty four batting average, one hundred and twenty five games played. Every single one of those games a start. Uh, and that's including the 14 games played, all starts in 2020 before the season was canceled. He had 168 hits in those 125 games played, 24 home runs, with 16 of those coming in his last season in 2021, uh, having a tremendous final season where he had an OPS of, looks like 1170, if again, my math is correct, 1170. Uh, for an OPS, 17 of his 31 stolen bases in his career coming in that final season. A very good player, like I said, 168 hits. 76 hits in his final year wasn't even his career high. No. His first season, he had 78 in his freshman year at Sam Houston. So that kind of backs up that you know kind of estimate on my part. It's the only claim to fame I probably have is getting that one right. Uh, but point is, very good player. Only took two years to get to the major leagues. And what seemed like every level, because I kept saying, yes, he's doing tremendous at every level. But it seemed like he was only at times spending maybe a month and a half at at some levels. Now, you understand, you know, rookie ball, you're not going to spend too long. If you do well for the first three weeks, you're getting called up. That's how that is. You're not going to spend long in rookie ball. But after that, it seemed like they kind of fast-tracked him a little bit. But... Every time he moved up, he continued to hit around 350, 340, 330, and he wasn't really stopping or slowing down at all. He kind of destroyed every level 
of minor league baseball, and he very much earned his spot at the major leagues. And like I said, getting the RBI single, helping out with his first hit. And like I mentioned earlier, I honestly thought he wasn't going to be on an opening day roster until next year. Mm -hmm. I thought he may have been a September call-up this year who may have in turn somehow qualified for a postseason spot because we all know at this point the Orioles are getting there. It's just a matter of where they're going to be. And at least in my estimate, it seems that right. way. But I'm glad that he's up now and he gets that major league experience, um, especially for somebody who deserves it. And only the second player from my high school, or no, third now, to ever make it from my high school of Side Ranch High School, Mustangs. Go Mustangs. Two of those are actually former Bearcats. Colton Kowser. Bryce Johnson. That's right. Yep. He was a star wide receiver as well for us in high school while playing baseball and, and was a part of one of the uh, the state championship teams as well. The first Mustang, former Astro, Corbin, Corbin Martin. Martin. So, and good lineage at that ranch. And, and, then, <laughs> and then Johnson, of course, you know, now with the Giants organization, right. seen some time at the major league level and uh, definitely will be called back up at some point. Absolutely. Um, I mean... Yeah, Colton Kowser. I mean, I, I obviously have a different experience with Colton, right. uh, just being one of his many broadcasters that have been able to call his games. And, uh, of course, you and I were in the Southland Tournament in 2021 and saw him, you know, on full display, you know. And, man, this kid could play ball. Mm -hmm. it, 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 he's that kind of guy when he comes to the plate. He's that guy that you think, oh, this guy, this ball's about to go very far. That's the kind of play he had. And you talked about how well he rose through the minor leagues once he got drafted out of Sam Houston. His career was a little slow in 21 once he started playing. Obviously, it's your jitters moving right from playing college ball in May yeah. to playing, you know, actual professional baseball in early August. So it was a bit slow at the start. But then last year, he just started hitting his stride. High A ball, four home runs, 22 RBIs before he got called up to Bowie. He had 10 home runs with Bowie in double-A ball, and then he made his way to triple-A towards the tail end of last season and was still able to slash five home runs, 11 RBIs. B batting average was a bit low at 219, mm -hmm. but then this year blew me away. Batting 330, 10 home runs, 40 RBIs to be one of the highly touted prospects, not only in the Orioles organization. He was only behind Jackson Holiday, yeah. who was last year's number one overall pick by Baltimore. So it makes sense, but... Number 14 in the, in the entire Major League Baseball was awesome to see. And then, yeah, now watching him last night, it's hard for me to believe, you know, I'm watching a guy play baseball and I was just calling his games two years ago. Right. It, it, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And as someone that was at his draft party, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it was stunning to see him go number five. I, look at our, I looked at our former SID, Ben Riker, because me and Ben were both there at that draft party in Cyprus. And I look at him and I'm like, is this about to happen? Because I'm up in the rafters trying to get a yeah. high video of the celebration and everything. And I was like, this is about to happen. And he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah. So first off, I mean, congrats, Colton. That's, yeah. that's exciting. And what an exciting time to be a Bearcat right now. You've got so many guys that have come through the Bearcats program that is uh, – either at the major league level or is going to get called up at some point once again. I mean, you got Ryan Tapera, Caleb Smith, Ryan O'Hearn, who hit a two-run shot yeah, he did. last night for the <laughs> Orioles, so Colton getting to be teammates with another Bearcat. Obviously never were teammates when they were there, but right. you got O'Hearn, um, you got Bryce Johnson, you know, and some other guys that, are, uh, that could be called up again. Hayden Wisnex Wisneski, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm blanking on his first name, but Mikulacic. Nick. Nick Mikulacic, he could be another guy that gets called up pretty soon as well. So Sam Houston's starting to pump out a lot. It has pumped out a lot of talent and will continue to pump out a lot of talent that have worn a Bearcat uniform. And Colton Kowser is obviously going to be one of those guys that is going to definitely have a very, very lengthy career in the, in the major leagues. We all hope. We all hope. <laughs> yes, we all hope that he will. I, I know going off of last night that it, it was his first game and everything, yeah. so there's a lot still that could happen, but he's going to be a part of an Orioles team that, you know, it, it's a little tough for him right now because look at the outfield depth that they have. Austin Hayes, yeah, Anthony Santander, and, of course, the big guy in center field, Cedric Mullins. Yeah. And, I, and, and you know, amongst all the other prospects that they have coming up through that organization – Baltimore has done the rebuild right. 
and now you're starting to see the fruits of it, and it's awesome to see that is going to be one of those fruits in there. His first and only trip to the city of Houston this season, September 18th through the 20th, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday schedule. Uh, against are we Baltimore doing any, here. Are, are at, we doing anything? <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Did we do we get tickets? <laughs> are, are we doing anything? <laughs> Is there a Wednesday it's football a bye week? It's a bye week for football. Yes, let's go. <laughs> we got to go. We got we to gotta gotta go, go see the debut. <laughs> we at least a home debut. Because trust me, I can tell you this from experience. There's going to be a ton of Cypress people who are going to show up and are going to show out. They did it with Corbin Martin. They're going to do it. They're going to do it for There'll Colin Cowser. There will be a bunch of Cypress people. There will be a bunch of Mustangs. A bunch of Mustangs. There will be a bunch of Bearcats <laughs> oh, yeah. in there in attendance. It's, it's going to be, be a good crowd. It's going to be hard to determine, is that guy wearing an Astros jersey or is he wearing right. a Bearcats jersey? No, granted, it's going to be September, so they're probably going to be in the middle of a, a AL West division race. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be a fun series nonetheless well, because at that point, the Orioles are also going to be in the thick of it. For an AL East title. You said, you said that it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday series? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're taking Monday off. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take, we're taking a second Labor Day. <laughs> we're going to take a second Labor Day. They're, they're going to ask us and be like, where are y'all going? I was like, we're going to Houston. we got to go watch Cowser go play. <laughs> I was like, you're not even going for the Astros? Absolutely not. <laughs> Folks, we'll try to get an interview with Cowser for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just record it on the phone and slap we're, it I'm, in. I'm, so. I'm not, I'm not going to give any promises. <laughs> But, you know, oh, I mean, like I said, con- congratulations to Colton Cowser and his family. That's, yeah. that's so exciting. Um, you know, obviously, you know, you have your background with them, having grown up with them, basically. And then, yeah. you know, I've got, I got to meet Colton at that draft night party. Um, you know, a heck of a guy. And I'm, I'm very excited to see what he can do. And I, 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 I'm really, really, I would just say proud to, to see uh, not only him being a Bearcat, but all the other Bearcats that are having so much success in the major leagues. So it's 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 an exciting time for Sam Houston in terms of professional baseball. So congrats to Kowser and his entire family on that, and I'm excited to see what is going to happen next. Speaking of what's going to happen next, as that'll wrap up our edition of the KSAM Sports Podcast today. Coming up next week, we'll talk more NBA free agency. We'll recap the MLB draft and the All-Star game as well as much, much more. And given how fast the world of sports changes on a dime, there could be something that pops up tomorrow that we'll talk about. (laughs) It'll be very interesting to see. Thanks for tuning in to this episode for my broadcast and podcast partner, Jordan Smith. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next week on the next edition of the KSAM Sports Podcast. For now, have a great rest of your day, evening, wherever you may be catching this podcast. And as always, eat them up, cats, and have a pleasant tomorrow.